St. John Bosco began to have dreams when he was nine years old. In these dreams, God communicated to him what he wanted John for his life, as well as what he should do with the oratory for boys that he ran with other Salesian priests. Often the dreams were prophetic and other times they were told in parables with a guide, such as an angel or a saint or the Blessed Mother, to explain what they meant. St. John didn't have these special dreams every night, but when he did, he knew when they were coming because he said he would always have a bad night's sleep the night before. He always told his boys about the dreams if they were about the state of their soul or some sort of warning. However, there was one dream that John Bosco did not want to tell. It was about hell and about the many of his boys that were on their way there. These dreams came about over the course of a week, one right after the other, and they were so stressful for John Bosco that he dreaded going to sleep at night and put it off for as long as he could. When he woke up, he was exhausted, more exhausted than if he had stayed up all night working. These dreams of hell were so horrible and terrifying that John didn't even want to think about them, much less talk about them. He dreaded trying to explain something so horrific to his boys that he put off talking about them until one night he dreamed that a demon came to visit him in his room. Often these demons took on the form of an animal or reptile, but not as we are used to seeing them. Instead, they were uglier beyond description and grotesque. They also smelled rancid. Weeks after his disturbing dreams of hell, a demon that resembled a toad, a large toad as big as an ox, came to terrify St. John, who was trapped in his bed, unable to get around the demon. St. John made the sign of the cross, but this did not work. He ordered the demon to leave, but instead the disgusting toad climbed up on his bed and leaned so close that he was nose to nose with it. So disgusting with the sight and smell that John didn't even want to touch it to push it away. Instead, he reached for his holy water by his bed, made the sign of the cross, and with the holy water flinged it at the monster. With a shriek, it vanished. Then John heard a mysterious voice say to him, Why don't you tell them? When he woke up, he realized that God didn't wish for John to keep these dreams to himself any longer. With that, here are the dreams that St. John had over the Holy Week, starting on Sunday. After warning his boys not to repeat the dreams to anyone or to write them down, he said, Well then, here are the dreams I would rather forget but must reveal. I dreamed that I was standing under the portico with a few other priests here at the oratory and all of you boys were with us as well. We were talking when suddenly all of you vanished except for the priests. Suddenly the oratory as we now know it changed in its appearance and looked as it had in the very beginning. At that time our playground adjoined vast untilled fields stretching up to the meadows where our boys often strayed in their games. Suddenly a gorgeous vine sprouted out from the ground. The vine kept growing to about a man's height, spreading countless shoots and tendrils into all directions until it covered the entire playground and stretched even beyond it. Oddly, its shoots did not grow upward, but spread out parallel to the ground, like a very vast arbor with no visible support. Its budding leaves were a deep green and its shoots were astonishingly healthy and strong. Soon, handsome clusters of grapes broke about grew in size, and took on a purplish-red color. How can this vine have grown so quickly, we asked each other in amazement. What does it all mean? Suddenly, all the grapes fell to the ground and turned into a crowd of lively, cheerful boys. In no time, the whole playground and the area covered by the vine were filled with boys who were jumping about, playing, and having a grand time. It was a sight to behold. There, under that unusual arbor, I could see all the boys who have been, are, or will be at the oratory in other slicing schools. Very many were unknown to me. A guide suddenly appeared on John's other side. He didn't specify if this guide was an angel or a saint. He only said he was a stranger. The stranger stood with St. John for a while, watching the boys play, when suddenly a mysterious curtain appeared, blotting out the scene before them. A gloom came upon them, and the stranger said, Look, and he pointed to the vine. I looked closer. The lovely grape-laden vine had now nothing but leaves bearing this inscription. He found nothing on it. Matthew 21, 19. 
Puzzled as to its significance, I asked my guide, Who are you? What does this vine symbolize? In answer, he parted the curtain. Only a portion of the great many boys that I had seen before were there now, most of them unknown to me. These boys, he explained, have plenty of opportunities for doing good, but they do not aim at pleasing God. They make believe they are doing good to keep up appearances. They painstakingly obey house rules to avoid reprimands or loss of esteem and are respectful towards superiors, but they do not profit by their teachings, exhortations, or efforts. All these boys strive for is some prominent money-making position in the world. They have no concern to discover the vocation. They readily reject the Lord's call, while they keep disguising their intentions lest they lose any advantage. In short, they are those who do things out of necessity and derive no good for eternity. How disappointed I was to see in that group several boys whom I believed to be very good, affectionate, and sincere. Unfortunately, this is not all, my guide continued, letting go of the curtain. Look up there now. Among the leaves, I could see clusters of grapes that looked very tasty. Happily, I got closer and noticed that the grapes were pockmarked, overripe, moldy, wormy, pecked, rotten, or were shriveled. A total disaster. Their stench followed the air. Again, the stranger lifted the curtain. Look, he said, I saw another throng of boys, but not the countless number as in the beginning of the dream. Formerly very handsome, they now appeared ugly, sullen, and covered with hideous sores, and they walked about with great melancholy, as if stooped or wasted by age. No one spoke. All were past, present, and future pupils of ours. The last mentioned were the most numerous. They all looked dejected and did not dare raise their eyes. My companions and I were dismayed and speechless. What happened? I finally asked my guide. These boys, once so handsome and joyful, why are they now so ugly and melancholy? Because of their sins, was the answer. And as the boys were walking past me, he added, take a good look at them. I noticed then that their foreheads and hands bore the name of each boy's sin. To my great surprise, I recognized several boys. I had always believed them to be very virtuous. Now I was discovering that hideous sores were festering in their souls. As they filed past, I could read on their foreheads, immodesty, scandal, malevolence, pride, idleness, gluttony, envy, anger, vindictiveness, blasphemy, impiety, disobedience, sacrilege, and theft. Not all the boys are as you see them now, my guide remarked, but they will be one day if they do not change their ways. Many of these sins are not serious in themselves, but they will lead to serious falls and eternal perdition. John took out his notebook to write down the names of the boys who were in danger of going to hell, but the guide would not let him. After arguing with him for a bit, the guide said, You may not do that. They have all they need to go through life unscathed. They have house rules. Let them observe them. They have superiors. Let them obey them. They have the sacraments. Let them receive them. They have penance. Let them not profane it by concealing different sins. They have the Holy Eucharist. Let them not partake of it in the state of mortal sin. Let them check their eyes, avoid bad companions, bad books, follow conversations, and so on. Keeping the house rules will save them. Let them promptly obey. Let them stop trying to fool their teachers so as to idle away their time. Let them willingly obey their superiors instead of looking upon them as boresome watchdogs, self-interested counselors, or even enemies. Let them not consider it a great victory when they succeed in concealing their wrongdoings and escaping punishment. Let them be reverent in church and pray willingly and devoutly without disturbing others or chattering. Let them study when it's time to study, work when it's time to work, and behave at all times. Study, work, and prayer are the things that will keep them good. Still, so great was St. John's worry for the boys that he again tried to write down the names. But the guide took the notebook and threw it down. He told him severely, For the last time, I say there is no need to write down their names. God's grace and the voice of conscience will tell your boys what not to do. Does this mean, I asked, that I cannot tell my dear boys anything of what I have seen? Have you any suggestion for them? You may tell them whatever you will remember, he replied. 
At the end of the dream, the guide once more showed St. John the vine. This time, it was filled with large, beautiful grapes. The guide explained, These are the boys who, thanks to your care, are yielding or will yield good fruit. They are those who practice virtue and will greatly console you. As happy as St. John was to see these boys, he felt sad that there were not as many as he had hoped. The vine and guide then vanished, and here the dream ended. This next dream happened in the same night after John woke for a bit and then fell back to sleep. He said, Suddenly, somebody shook me awake. I found myself in my room, answering my mail. Afterward, I walked to the balcony, gazed for a moment at the majestic dome of our new church, and then went downstairs and stepped into the porticos. At short intervals, priests and clerics came from their various assignments and crowded around me. Among them, Father Rua, Father Caliero, Father Francesa, Father Francia, and Father Savio. As I stood chatting with them, the Church of Mary, Help of Christians, and all our present buildings abruptly disappeared, and we found ourselves in front of the old Penardi shed. As in the previous dream, a vine sprouted up in exactly the same place, as if from the same roots, grew to the same height, and then spread its shoots horizontally throughout a vast area. The shoots in turn sprouted leaves, then there came clusters of grapes that ripened under my very eyes but no boys were to be seen. The bunches of grapes were truly enormous, like those of the Promised Land. Father Calerio and the other priests marveled, while I kept exclaiming, how gorgeous they are. Then Father Calerio plucked a few grapes and put one in his mouth. No sooner did he sink his teeth into it, than he spat it out so forcefully that we thought he was vomiting. The grape had the taste of a rotten egg. Goodness gracious, he exclaimed after much spitting. What stuff! It's enough to kill a man! At this moment, a serious-looking man came out of the sacristy of the old chapel and determinedly strode up to me. How can such beautiful grapes taste so rotten? I asked him. Come here, he said, and read what's written on the grapes. I noticed then that they bore the name of each pupil and his predominant sin. I was aghast at what I saw. I was particularly frightened by such inscriptions. Proud, unfaithful to his promises, unchaste, two-faced, neglectful of his duties, calumniator, vindictive, heartless, sacrilegious, contemptuous of authority, stumbling block, and follower of false doctrines. This is the fruit we get from this vineyard, the man said gravely, bitter, bad, and harmful to eternal salvation. I immediately tried to jot down some names in my notebook, but again my guide stopped me. What are you up to? he asked. Please, let me take down the names of those I know so that I can warn them privately and correct them, I pleaded. It was no use. He would not consent. If they do not believe the gospel, he replied, they won't believe you either. After ignoring John's protests, the guide walked up to Father Rua and handed him a stick, telling him to strike the vine. Father Rua struck the vine once, and immediately the grapes swelled up and became shriveled as small as snail shells. The guide said, Watch now, the Lord takes his vengeance. John Bosco writes, Immediately, the sky darkened and a dense fog covered the vine entirely from our sight. Through the darkness, lightning flashed, thunder roared, and dreadful thunderbolts struck everywhere over the playground. The vine shoots bent under the furious wind, and all the leaves were stripped away. Finally, a hailstorm hit the vine. I tried to flee, but my guide held me back. Look at the hail, he said. I noticed that the hailstones, big as eggs, were either black or red, each pointed at one end and flat on the other, like a mallet. Those nearest to me were black, but beyond I could see the red ones. The guide ordered John to pick up a hailstone, but the smell coming from it was so bad that it took John many attempts to finally get himself to pick one up. Overcoming my revulsion, I took up a black hailstone and read on it, Immodesty. Then I walked over to the red hailstones. Though ice cold, they started fires wherever they fell. I picked one up. It still smelled very bad, but I found it easier to read on it. Pride. I asked, are these then the two main vices threatening this house? These are the two main vices that ruin most souls, not only in your house, but all over the world. In due time, you will see how many will plunge into hell because of them. 
Meanwhile, hailstones kept pelting the vine furiously amid thunder and lightning. The grapes were now a mess, looking like they had been thoroughly crushed by someone's feet in a vat. The juice followed the air with such a sickening stench that it was hardly possible to breathe. Each grape gave out a foul smell of its own, each more repelling than the other, depending on the number and kind of sin. Unable to stand it, I put my handkerchief to my nose and turned to go to my room. I realized then that I was utterly alone. Father Francisa, Father Rua, and Father Clero, and all the others had fled. In that silence and solitude, I became so frightened that I broke into a run and woke up. As you see, this was a very nasty dream, but what happened the following night was much worse. <laughs>